So today it's my very much pleasure to present to you joint work together with my colleagues, Martin Jones, Christian Rosso, and my advisor, Ben Stock. Uh, this talk will be on the particularly overlooked threat of persistent client-side cross-site scripting. And when we typically talk about cross-site scripting and what you'll read up in most textbooks is that we'll categorize cross-site scripting into three categories. So that is reflected XSS, persistent, and DOM-based XSS. Uh, so the particular threat we want to investigate uh, lies somewhere in the intersection of persistent and DOM-based XSS. Uh, so we'll actually argue that it makes sense for us to kind of uh, distribute the vulnerabilities into two dimensions. So we have server and client side, that is where the vulnerable code portion resides, and that is reflected and persistent as usual. And in this talk, we'll focus on uh, persistent client side cross site scripting, and you can see a code excerpt uh, highlighted on the slide, which uh, depicts a, 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 a kind of sample exploit. So you can see that there is an, an, uh, the local storage, there is an item being retrieved. The local storage is essentially a client-side database, and it's being used within a code-executing context that is document-write. So uh, what this allows an attacker, if he now controls that particular storage entry, to kind of add his HTML markup into the storage and thus get his code executed within the application. So uh, what are there actually on the client side for storage mechanisms that we can make use of? And also then, what kind of uh, things can an attacker abuse to get his code then executed. Uh, so the first thing which might come to your mind are actually cookies. So cookies were meant as a, as a way to augment HTTP with state. Uh, so you can kind of now store session information on the client side, but also store other information there. So for example, the language selection of your users. Uh, what is important in terms of cookies for the threat of persistent client side cross site scripting is that they're bound to an ETLD plus one. That means you can, for example, set a cookie from a subdomain to a parent domain. Also important is that they're limited in their character sets. You cannot make use of semicolons because a semicolon is actually used as a delimiter for a cookie. Uh, and also they're quite limited in their size, which is why there's something called local storage being introduced to the web with the advent of HTML5, which kind of gets rid of some of these restrictions. So in contrast to cookies, local storage is actually bound to an origin, that is the, the tuple of protocol host and port, and you can store a little bit more in there. So having talked about the sources which we consider for persistent client-side storage, now let's take a look at the different things which we investigated to, uh, to kind of get these stored values at some point to being interpreted as code. So you've already seen HTML markup interpreting things, so document write in the previous example, but there's also inner HTML and, and many others which allow for string to HTML code conversions. There's also direct JavaScript executing things, for example, eval or set timeout. Uh, and there is a more subtle way, namely, uh, if uh, a value is being used uh, inside the script source attribute and an attacker can control that value, it can actually start pointing that, that source to its own controlled web server and host his malicious payload at his own server. So now that we've kind of fixed the scope of what we want to capture in terms of persistence and also then code execution, let's get to the, the question which we wanted to answer with our research. And that is, how prevalent is this threat of persistent client-side cross-site scripting in the wild? So how many web applications can we actually find a flow from persistence into code execution? And having talked about sources and things and there's some data flow, what better way to actually kind of find these things than making use of taint tracking? For that, we built upon previous research from uh, Likita Dal back from 2013, which augmented uh, a Chromium instance with uh, byte level tainting. And what this basically gives us is exactly kind of the attribution between our different storage mechanisms and a potentially dangerous sync access. So in contrast to the previous example, you will now see that there's again a local storage item being retrieved, but this time is used within the context of eval. So now if we have collected such a flow, we can then start building uh, exploit candidates for this. As this is not something entirely new and it's not a major contribution of our work, I just skip, uh, skip quickly over the process. So if we have now visited the, the website in a normal fashion and we have observed such a data flow, for example, that the value foo is being used exactly inside uh, this assignment to the variable user, uh, we can then start to build the attacker's payload which breaks out of this context and then gives the attacker the ability to execute his own code. And how such a thing might look like is when we put it into our automated exploit generation that we'll then have an exploit which actually uh, kind of terminates the, the string assignment. So if you look at the, the inserted payload into the eval string, you'll see that the, the string is terminated, there is a semicolon, and then there is our payload. In this case, it's alert XSS. Uh, 
And uh, we'll make this part of our code base open source, so you can find more details about this in the paper. Uh, and it should be up and running within the next couple of weeks. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, now, having these exploit candidates, we have an URL on which we found a data flow. We have the specific storage entry from which the, the value was retrieved, so either cookies or local storage. Uh, and we'll have this candidate exploit. So now we can start validating whether our build exploit candidates are really uh, kind of being triggered. Because the application itself could go on and, for example, check for the integrity of the stored values and refrain from actually executing the payload if it finds that the storage value was tampered with. So what we would then do is kind of visit the, the site, which we found the flow on, again, to prime all the cookies and the local storage values. Uh, then we can tamper with the specific uh, storage value, so set it to our exploit candidate. And then what is important, we need to reload the page. And if now on the reloaded page, the same flow is present uh, and uh, there is no integrity check in place, the attacker's payload would be executed and we could verify that. So having this automated pipeline from finding data flows to building exploit candidates to verifying that they're really persistently executed within the victim's browser if they're being stored in the client-side database, we can now turn to a large-scale study about this particular threat. So we did an empirical study about uh, using the Alexa top 5,000 most prominent applications. And what we found is that around 2,000 of the application actually make use of persistent data somewhere within their application. Uh, there are 1,600 of these which kind of take data from cookies and use it within their application, and there is 940 which do so with local storage. Now, the kind of interesting thing is that we found 418 domains which are actually exploitable by such a flow. So there's uh, an, attacker control, uh, an attacker exploitable flow from persistence into code execution. We found 213 domains which had such a flow originating from cookies, and 222 originating from local storage. If you pay close attention, these numbers don't add up, which just simply means that there are sites which have both a vulnerable cookie and a vulnerable local storage flow. What is quite interesting if you look at local storage specifically is that out of the 941 local storage uh, sites making use of persistent local storage data, actually every fourth makes use of it incorrectly so that an attacker could actually exploit it. So this leaves us with kind of the impression that actually developers put trust into the integrity of whatever is stored inside the user's browser. So they think that this is kind of whatever they've written in there stays there and it's not controllable by an attacker. But also, we've kind of assumed the strong attacker model. So these 400 domains are susceptible if an attacker is actually capable of uh, injecting a storage entry inside the victim's browser. Uh, so for that, we actually also wanted to investigate how kind of normal attacker models could tamper with these storages. And for that, we kind of found two attacker models, which we now call infection vectors, since they're trying to infect the user's browser or the user's storage entry. And again, to reiterate, uh, for this attacker model, it's important that a single infection actually leads to a permanent code execution on the client side, because uh, the, the flow is present on each subsequent page visit. So the first attacker model which can actually achieve this kind of uh, persistent, this kind of infection is the network attacker. And as usual, the network attacker just sits somewhere in the middle between the, the user and the web server and intercepts and injects his uh, payloads into HTTP traffic. Uh, and what, think about if you're visiting an, an HTTP site, so for example, the captive portal, an attacker can then go on and inject uh, an iframe pointing to the application which he wants to attack, which is in that case httpbank.com. And since it points to an HTTP resource, he can go on and about and also intercept that request. And what this gives him is the, ability, the capability to execute, script, uh, to, uh, to execute a script payload within bank.com. So what he can do is set cookies, uh, which are then also valid for the HTTPS version, or also he can inject his values into the storage of uh, the HTTP origin of bank.com. What is now important that, is that there is a security mechanism which might actually interfere, namely HSTS. HSTS is a response header which could be deployed by bank.com, which instructs the browser to only ever visit uh, bank.com using HTTPS again. There's still one caveat, namely uh, a normal deployment of HSTS only instructs the browser to do this for the specific domain, so not for subdomains. There is an additional flag, include subdomains, which kind of instructed to do basically what the title suggests. So if the include subdomain flags is missing, an attacker can just point it to a non-existing subdomain and then 
kind of intercept the request again because HSTS is not in place. If you think back about cookies, since you can set them from subdomains to parent domains, an attacker could then go on and just set uh, a cookie for bank.com from the non-existing subdomain. The second infection vector which we considered was the web attacker. Uh, in our case, the web attacker tries to make use of another reflected access S uh, and thus gains code execution in that specific origin. So if he has code execution in the HTTPS origin, you can also tamper with the local storage of the HTTPS origin. Uh, also setting cookies as beforehand. So having these two infection vectors in place, we can now evaluate our 418 found cases of persistent client-side cross-site scripting according to these attacker models. And what we found is that actually 290 domains are susceptible to our notion of a network attacker because they either completely lacked HTTPS adoption or by, because they missed the include subdomains flag. Uh, as for the web attacker, we've, uh, we've looked for reflected client-side cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and found that 65 domains were end-to-end -end exploitability because they had both a reflected client-side XSS and a persistent client-side XSS. Uh, this has to be considered lower bound since we only looked for that particular kind of reflected cross-site scripting. And there's a Whitehead security report indicating that every third application actually suffers from a cross-site scripting. So this number is likely much higher. And also thinking about you only need a single infection since vulnerabilities come and go in the web, this can also change dramatically on the point in time where we actually look at the, at the web. So uh, we did not only want to understand kind of how this uh, threat of persistent class across that scripting impacts web application uh, security landscape. We also wanted to take a look at uh, what developers actually try to achieve when they made use of the persisted data uh, in their application. And for that, we found four classes where we could distribute our found uh, vulnerabilities into according to the proposed solutions on how developers could actually do so securely instead of insecurely. The first class being the developer wanted to store some textual data within the client-side database. So it was just some piece of, of text and then he used an, either an insecure sync to, to display it. For that, he can uh, just resort to a safer sync alternative, so uh, instead of in the HTML making use of inner text, or make use of some context-aware sanitization. Uh, we found this category to be present on 214 domains. Uh, the next category being structured data, with this was the case for 108 domains, so they kind of stored stringified objects into either of these storage mechanisms, and they made use of eval to parse these again, which allows direct execution of JavaScript for an attacker. Uh, for that, most of the sites can actually resort to JSON parse, with 27 being incompatible because they made use of single ticks instead of uh, double ticks, which means they either need to switch up their syntax to make use of proper JSON notation or kind of resort to custom parsers. We found on 101 domains that they really try to employ some client-side client -side code caching mechanisms, so either they store HTML or JavaScript code in the client-side storage. And they didn't check for integrity. So either they can deploy uh, integrity checks, or they can also make use of service workers, which is a mechanism uh, which came up with the progressive web apps to allow for offline uh, app usage. And what is important for service workers, since they also have kind of a storage, but this is out of reach for both of our infection vectors. So as a last category, we found that 28 domains actually stored host names in, in, the, in the storages uh, for kind of client-side load balancing reasons. And for each of these cases, a simple whitelist would have sufficed to secure the application. So to shortly wrap up, what you've seen today is uh, the threat of persistent client-side cross-site scripting, which has been rather overlooked in the past, uh, which is kind of a little bit nasty since a one-time infection vector gains the attacker a permanent foothold in the victim's browser. It's relatively hard to detect and leaves, in most instances, no traces on the server side. Uh, so we've also conducted the first large-scale study of this particular threat, and we found that out of the 5,000 investigated applications, 2,000 actually make use of persistent data somewhere within their application, with 418 actually doing so incorrectly, such that an attacker can exploit this. Uh, we've also applied reward attacker models to, to find the impact on web application security at scale. We found that 290 domains are susceptible to our notion of a network attacker, and for 65 domains we could uh, uh, go on and do an end-to-end -end exploitation since we found both a reflected client-side XSS and a persistent client-side XSS. And with that, I'd like to close. I'm thanking you for your attention, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.
So you had an exploration of the types of uh, data that were stored in local mm -hmm. storage, right? So is it your opinion that pretty much you should not be storing any code there uh, and you should just be storing you know, very well-defined JSON data that you can then you know, properly parse right. and anything else is just an abuse of the local storage mechanism? So I think if you kind of leave uh, service workers out of the equation, then it's kind of a valid thing to store code in there, but then you need to make sure that whatever's written in there is actually still the same and you want to retrieve the value. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I think service workers are just a more elegant way to kind of uh, do client-side code caching. Uh, and besides, yeah, that's, that's okay. the other. And um, so, for your uh, for one of the two types of attackers, so you mm -hmm. essentially required a reflected XSS. Yes. Right? So my question is, you know, if you do have a reflected XSS, mm -hmm. what exactly is it that you gain by pivoting mm -hmm. and changing the storage as opposed to just using that reflected XSS? Mm -hmm. That's a valid question. So uh, especially uh, given what you want to achieve when you make use of an XSS, is you probably want to uh, gain some monetary money gain. So you want to kind of hijack the, the user's account and you want to exfiltrate some information. Uh, if you now think about kind of hijacking the session, how would you do that? Since most of the authentication cookies are now being, uh, being behind HTTP only fla uh, flags, so you cannot actually retrieve them. So what you would need to do is fish for the user's credential in a way. And if you have the impression as, as a user, also in, in the setting of a network attacker, that you're in an unsafe environment, or you click the link and you're suddenly on Facebook and you should log in, then you probably would hesitate. And what a persistent payload on the client side gives you is the ability to plant a, a keylogger or also to just continuously uh, monetize the victim's, resource, victim's resources using, for example, uh, the crypto mining. So these are kind of the more prominent uh, attack vectors which I see for persistent payloads on the client side. I see. Okay, so let's thank the speaker once more. Thank you.